Hello students, welcome to EPG Path Shala. I am Dr. Vibha Dhawan from Terry. Today we are going to talk about the module on setting up of a tissue culture laboratory under the paper plant biotechnology and crop improvement. In this module, you are going to learn what are the basic facilities required to set up a tissue culture studies. And then we are talk, also will be discussing about specialized needs for specific purposes. Now, tissue culture lab, it depends on what is your objective. Is it a research lab? Are you going to extend your studies to pilot level or you are going to set up commercial tissue culture labs? So that dictates the size of the lab as well as the infrastructure requirements. For any tissue culture work, a well-equipped laboratory is required. Depending on the size of the operations, the requirement may vary both in terms of size and therefore investments. But there is some basic infrastructure that is required, whether it's a research lab or a commercial lab. So you can demark those areas that these are the basic facilities and that's what we are going to talk about. The laboratory should consist of an area for storing glassware, plasticware, chemicals, then an area where you can wash your glassware, whether it's new or the used one. And then it is to be dried before you use. And it depends either you keep adequate area for drying or you have equipment for drying. Next room where you move this is the media preparation room. So there has to be an area demarcated where you prepare media. And we also call this as media kitchen. The media needs to be sterilized. So depending on the size, either you have a separate room for sterilization or you keep autoclave in the same laboratory. Thereafter, in the sterilized media, you put your explants and therefore you need sterile hoods, what we call as laminar airflow cabinets to carry out the aseptic manipulations. And then these cultures are incubated and controlled conditions of light and temperature. So those rooms where we keep these cultures, they are called growth rooms. And finally, whatever you produce, whatever plantlets are produced, they are to be gradually acclimatized and therefore acclimatization area consisting of greenhouses, polyhouses, open nursery and so on. So we'll discuss about each of these areas one by one. So whatever work you do, whether it's in your office, whether it's at home, whether it's in a tissue culture lab. You have to keep certain inventory of chemicals or the consumables that you use every day. So in plant tissue culture also, you keep inventory of all your glassware, plasticware, chemicals and so on. Small things like aluminium foil, tissue paper and so on, whatever is to be used when you prepare media or when you grow the plants, your instruments and so on. So that area is called store. And store. this store is like any other store. You have shelves to keep various kinds of chemicals, various kinds of uh, uh, con uh, consumables of the equipments and so on. So you keep this. Now, what is important in the store is that you maintain an inventory. Some of the chemicals, they are to be imported. Some of the chemicals are not available off the shelf. Thus, you have to be very careful in defining the reorder level because some of the chemicals which comes from overseas may take two to three months to come. And some of the chemicals are to be stored at uh, sub-zero temperature in the freezer, some in the refrigerator. So you have to maintain inventory of that kind which needs to be uh, reviewed regularly and you in ensuring that the reorder levels take care of the time gap which is required to procure uh, a particular chemical. Now, as I said earlier, whatever you use, the even the new glassware, uh, everything is to be washed, properly washed and then used in plant tissue culture. 
you will appreciate that in plant tissue culture you are very careful you add chemicals in micrograms and therefore and you use chemicals which are either analytical grade or laboratory grade depending on the final purpose but what is important is that everything is so controlled that any uh, thing which is not wanted uh, if anything is sticking to the jar that impurity might lead to a different response than what you require and therefore all your glassware plasticware whatever is to be used has to be carefully washed even on the first time the new glassware and of course once you use that then it again comes through the same uh, path of washing properly now what do we do in this all your glassware it is first dipped and if it's dirty we do the first dipping in mild acid solution but otherwise into a soap soap solution then you wash it carefully now if it's a small lab then brushes simple brushes like uh, what you use in washing baby uh, feeders so those brushes are adequate but in most cases you go to the next step and that is you have brushes on the motor so it becomes very fast you put one and that's what is being shown in the photograph you put it in on on it and take it out so your everything is washed properly there is provision especially of the glassware washing machines which are available especially in the western countries and we have done a study on it whether it is feasible but in most cases and for most laboratories it is not commercially viable your energy costs are very high and the volume of glassware which can be washed is too little so if you are really going on a commercial scale then it becomes uh, you cannot do it and even in the west they largely use disposable containers rather than going for glassware washing machines then depending on the need once you have washed it and also the quality of water because if your water water is hard then you have to go to the final step of washing your glassware with ro water similarly if you are going for protoplast culture then also you have to give the final rinse in ro water and in very sophisticated molecular biology work sometimes with milliku water as well your next step is before you use this glassware that it should be dried because there shouldn't be any trace of water because one milli ml of water will also add to difference in if you are adding another 220 ml of it and 1 ml is water it becomes 21 so therefore you don't want even 1 ml sticking to your jar or tube so whatever so it is to be properly dried again for drying purpose there are two possibilities one is that you keep this glassware upside down in a room where there is no dust and the other possibility is that you put it in uh, uh, dryers but again that is energy intensive and you avoid that if you can afford uh, to dry it overnight now coming to the next area that is the media preparation area and we call it media preparation laboratory it's the kitchen of plant tissue culture laboratory that is where you prepare food for your cultures so therefore as i said you prepare food so what do you require you require a center table where you can work freely where you can put your empty jars and pour the media you add your stock solutions and so on so the working table in the center one precaution you have to take because you are using all kinds of glassware borosilicate sophisticated jars and so on so you have to be careful that the top of the center table that is not very hard and therefore you avoid granite granite is very easy to clean but at the same time it's so hard that any mishandling of glassware it costs you a lot it will simply break then on the sides you have the benches on the sides 
where all your chemicals are kept in the shelves and you have other equipment like stirrers, pH meter, weighing balances and so on. So it has to be an easy flow of material. You weigh it on one side. You also might have gas stove where you melt agar. So from there, you bring it to the center table. You do the pouring of the media. Again, depending on how much of media is to be poured, if the volumes are very large, some labs go for automatic media dispenser. And in many laboratories, people find it far more simpler to pour it manually. The media which we prepare, it's rich in sugar and all the inorganic salts. So therefore, this media can also promote microbial growth. The first step thus is to sterilize this media and that is done in an autoclave. Autoclave is an equipment for generating steam at about 121 degrees centigrade under pressure. So it's nothing but a larger version of pressure cooker that you use at home. And there are a range of sizes and shapes which are available. They are, can be vertical, horizontal, single door, double door. So it all depends on the usage, the scale at which you have to prepare media and so on. In fact, when tissue culture started, people were sterilizing, scientists were sterilizing media in simple pressure cookers. But now we have these autoclaves and the one which is shown in this photograph, that's a large autoclave being used for a commercial tissue culture lab. And it sterilizes close to 25 liters of media in one go, but various sizes are available. Now, it can either be kept in the media preparation area or in a separate room. If your operations are large, then it's always kept in a separate room, which is well ventilated as autoclave generates a lot of heat. In commercial tissue culture labs, most of the times double door autoclaves are used in which prepared media is loaded from one side and after sterilization, you open it from the other side, which is in the clean area. So there is no movement from non-clean to clean area. It's the media is simply the autoclave is open on the other side. Of course, people prefer that and there are few who are against this because they feel since you open it in the clean area, the humidity in that area is gradually built up, which again may cause problem in terms of microbial growth. But from the ease point of view and even in terms of cleanliness, that is a better option. In small labs and especially those who are engaged with molecular biology lab, their requirements are very small. So they will just require maybe a liter of media to be done in a day. And therefore, they have small autoclaves in which you sterilize the media. And why it is important is that at pressure of 15 pounds and temperature of 121 degrees centigrade, 15 to 25 minutes, depending on how much media is in each while, is adequate to sterilize it. However, we use the same autoclave for sterilizing the gowns which the clean area operators wear, the instruments which are used in the clean area periodically, as well as the contaminated cultures. And for that, the duration of autoclaving that may go up to one hour. Your dry cycle is one hour, contaminated culture cycle is one hour, but as I said earlier, in most cases, when media is being sterilized, your cycle is 15 to 25 minutes. After autoclaving, although you are extremely careful in terms of uh, autoclaving cycle and you take adequate care, but many times there are problems. And therefore, whatever media is prepared, it must be stored for three days before you use it because you can't afford to lose your cultures at any stage. So all the media which is prepared is kept in the media store. It's again a room which is in the clean area and therefore class 100,000 sterility levels are maintained. And it has simple shelves uh, not fitted, may or may not be with lights. Some laboratories, they go for light fitting as well because that is for easy observation if there is any contamination. and 
depending on again what I said earlier, the scale at which media is prepared and if it is a single door, you bring it through a pass box where UV lights are fitted and you bring it to the media store and if it is double door, that it directly opens into the media store. Another thing in media store is that we fit UV lights so that after autoclaving, there is no chance of any contaminant getting into the jar. So, if it, the media is sterilized properly, it will be kept in the sterilized stage in the media store. And if by chance you observe any contamination, uh, of course, you can find out the nature of contaminant as well because many a times if your uh, cotton plugs, they are bad and they contain lot of fun fungus growing over there, then that is the fault of the plug and not of the media. But if you find contamination on the media, then you discard the entire batch. The sterilized media, then it is to be inoculated and that we carry out in the transfer area. Transfer area, you can consider equivalent to an operation theater. So, that is the kind of cleanliness level you have to maintain in this room. Simply because all your jars contaminated, uh, the jars empty with fresh media as well as with the mother cultures, they will be opened in this particular room, transfer room. You may have, depend, again depending on the scale of operations, you may have a single laminar hood and in that case you may not even have a transfer area, it can be just a quiet corner of your laboratory otherwise. But uh, if your operations are large, then there is a dedicated transfer area with series of laminar airflow cabinets. Now, laminar airflow cabinets, they have unidirectional flow of air through HEPA filters. So, HEPA filters prevents any microbes to get into that particular area. And it's as I said, it's unidirectional. So it's coming from one side, an operator is sitting on the other, you open it on that side. So nothing goes from the other side, and it's one side flow of air. And you'll find that all those who work in this area, they do wear lab coats, which is again sterilized. They wear headgear, so that head cap, so that nothing falls from the hair. And let me tell you, from here, there are a lot of contaminants which get into. In fact, in India, we also have tradition of wearing flowers and they also carry a lot of microbes. So therefore, uh, all those who are working here, they wipe their hands with alcohol time and again, so that anything which is sticking to their hands, uh, no microbe can get transferred to the cultures. Now, once you have done inoculation in the laminar airflow cabinet, of course, as I said that you wipe your hands time and again, you sterilize your instruments by putting it in hot bead sterilizer. Uh, so you take every precaution and you close it in the laminar airflow cabinet itself. But these cultures, because they will take a while to grow, so you bring them to another room, which is called growth room. Now, growth room, we maintain uniform temperature of any, like depends on the species, but most species, they grow well at 25 degrees centigrade. So you have to maintain temperature with maximum variation of 2 degrees centigrade. But of course, Depending on the species, you may have variation in terms of temperature. Some species, they like temperate species, they prefer to grow at lower temperature and tropical species prefer to grow at higher temperature. So you can maintain temperature anywhere from 15 to 35 degrees centigrade depending on the species. And therefore, even for larger laboratories, it is advisable to go for multiple rooms rather than a single room. Now, since you have to maintain uniform temperature, air conditioning alone is not enough. You will find even when you are sitting in a room anywhere, near the ducts temperature is lower, 
and the farther end of the room temperature may be comparatively higher. So you cannot have because cultures they respond to temperature so much that you cannot afford that kind of discrepancy. Thus the air conditioned ducts they open at the level of the shelf. You also ensure good circulation. Now this room although your cultures are in closed vials but still you don't want any microbes and therefore this room does not have any opening except one door which opens in the clean area. There are no windows in these incubation rooms or growth rooms. So these are closed structures. You don't want any microbe and thus the walls have plastic paint so nothing settles there. Sterility levels are very high and your cultures are continuously observed. The humidity is taken care of because your jar is closed, but you have to be careful in terms of light. So usually 3000 lux is adequate, but again, depending on the species, you might have to keep cultures in dark, you might have to increase light intensity, even different stages of the same culture that may require different light intensities. Rooting may require higher light intensity, but it depends again which stage requires how much of light. Earlier we were using tube lights, but now the use of LEDs is becoming very common in growth rooms. So what I have discussed so far is more for the cultures which are grown on semi-solid media. But then you do have cultures which grow in suspensions. It can be single cell culture, it can be cell aggregates, it can be algal cells and so on. Even many tissues of the higher plants, they also perform better in the liquid culture. So in liquid culture, you have to provide support or you keep them on agitation. You keep on moving them so that there is no problem of aeration. Similarly, when you are standardizing at what temperature the tissue grows best, you have to standardize that temperature and you cannot afford the entire growth room to play around because you want to see variation in temperature 18 degree, 19 degree, 20 degree, 21 degree. So that kind of variation you want to see. So when you are dealing on standardization on small scale or with liquid cultures, you require a different set of equipment such as BOD incubators. In BOD incubator, you can precisely control temperature. Like if you are standardizing for any species, you don't know whether it will grow best at 15 degrees or 20 degrees or somewhere in between. So your first experiment is more on 15, 20, 25. But when you know that it's doing well, say at 20 degrees centigrade, but 20 is not the optimal, then you will set another experiment where it will be 19, 20, 21. It's growing better at 21. Your next experiment will be 21, 22, 23. So you exactly set up the temperature at which it grows best. Similarly, what light intensities are required? Because in a commercial lab, what is important for you to save every penny on the electricity and at the same time give the best to the plant. So therefore, it is not 3000 lux, it can be 2900 lux, it can be 3200 lux. So therefore that standardization you do in BOD incubator and then of course you shift those conditions, you make those conditions in your culture room. Similarly, if you have to put your cultures under shade, then you decide what RPM is required. So that also you can easily achieve in BOD incubator. So while cultures are incubated, Again, you have to observe them critically. Normally, we say three week passage is enough or whatever for callus, slow growing callus, it can be five weeks. But you decide on this duration based on the growth, the observations. So all these cultures, they are to be observed critically while they are growing. And you do it, uh, either you assign a separate room, what we call as observation room or Again, if your lab is small, you can just do it sitting on a table. Some of the cultures, they are to be observed under the microscope. And even 
Some of the cultures are to be prepared under the microscope, especially when you are dealing with virus infected plants and you have to uh, isolate the meristematic dome. So observation of cultures is a very critical stage, very critical step, because if you don't observe them carefully, you might miss on many, many discoveries. So sometimes your objective is different and when you observe your culture different, uh, carefully, you observe something which you haven't even thought about. So every culture is to be observed carefully and once they have finished their growth, once you are through with either the rooting or whatever your objective was, then the cultures are taken out for two purposes. One is that it's the ultimate, like if your objective was protoplast fusion and then you proceed further with getting a plantlet out of it. But ultimately what you get is a plantlet of the desired type. If, it, if your objective was micropropagation, those will be clonal images of the mother plant from which you have started. Your objective was embryo rescue, you get a rare plant, the kind of plant you require double haploids, then it's a double haploid plantlet. If your objective was genetic engineering, again, you get transformants. But then these plants are to be taken out to the natural environment. So from observation room, you're satisfied with the plant's growth and everything. It is given to the transfer area. So in transfer area, like, of course, we talk of these plants as complete plants because they have root, they have shoot or they are somatic embryos. They are complete plants, but you'll discuss, we'll be discussing about it later. They are green in color, but not absolutely normal. There are certain abnormalities which we gradually have to tackle and therefore these plants are to be gradually acclimatized as well. So what we do in the transfer room is we wash the plants of the agar. We ensure because if any agar is sticking to it, that can attract microbes as well. So therefore you want to remove the agar, you transfer them to the potting mix. Again, depending on the sensitivity of the plant, the potting mix can be sterilized or it may not be because you don't want to kill microbes either, the beneficial microbes. And then you take them to the greenhouses. So what we do in the greenhouse, and of course you'll realize yourself what these plants all through have been grown under high humidity conditions. They were given artificial nutrients and the light was adequate for its growth. So nothing was in excess. So it is something like a over pampered baby. So this baby now has to realize the outside natural conditions. So what we do in greenhouse is that initially keep these plants at very high humidity levels and comparatively low light intensities. And you complete this journey from one end to the other, maybe in two weeks time, mostly in two weeks time. And if outside conditions are very harsh, then you shift them to polyhouses. So in this two weeks, the plant gets acclimatized to the outside environment. Its cuticular waxes starts developing, it starts photosynthesizing and so on. So you'll be learning again more about it in the later chapter. Uh, with this, we complete with what are the basic requirements to set up a tissue culture lab. What do you require if you want to enter into the field of tissue culture? You have also learned what are the differences between a small scale laboratory and a large laboratory, the basic infrastructure and the specialized infrastructure, which is required for specific needs. So I hope you have learned adequately to set up a tissue culture lab and sure you will use it sometime in your life.